that number is so volatile, changes so often that I, I would not want them to base how well they're doing or how, how hard they're trying because of one number. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. The skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. So glad you're with us, and I want to tell you, Abby Brown, our co-host, is not with us today, so it feels very different. We have Dr. Michaela Voss, who is our medical co-host, and and we're talking to Dr. Shelley Barr today, who is a medical provider at the Stanford University Medical School, subspecialty degree in adolescent medicine. And so there's some good conversation between Dr. Voss and Dr. Barr, and talking about the scale, how to do medical telehealth. Is it even possible? What are you going to miss? What are some things that are actually better about it? One of the things that Dr. Barr does is watches her patient get on the scale if she does medical telehealth. And she tells us about orthostasis and how she does that, growth charts and determining appropriate weight in kids and how bone growth is such an important consideration, and kind of the endocrine features, like what would you look at besides weight to understand the progress? So I hope you enjoyed this episode with Dr. Shelley Barr. Welcome, Dr. Shelley Barr, to the Seasoned RD podcast. Hi, it's nice to be here. Well, we are going to warm up with just a few questions before we get to know you better. And we know we ha- that you have some things to, to share with us of what you have learned as an eating disorders medical doctor. And this is part of our medical series. But the first question for you, mountains or beach? Beach. Really? That was fast. And you're in L.A., right? I'm in LA. Yeah. But you know, my whole life I've been back and forth from Montreal to Tel Aviv, Israel. So I spent a lot of time on the beach there and yeah, the water is so soothing. So Tel Aviv, Israel. Mm -hmm. Yes. What what was your, what were Um, you doing? My parents were born there and they moved to Canada when I was three. So we would go back to visit family every summer. Wow. Okay. Very cool. I almost went to med school there. Oh, (laughs) that was fun. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad I did it, but um, awesome. Okay. I got another one for you. Breakfast or dinner? Oh, breakfast or dinner? love it. That was my answer too. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last one is audio book or paper book? Paper. So you've got the old fashioned holding paper in your hand kind of. Yeah. I like, I've always been an avid reader. I mean, it was something I would do with my dad every Sunday. We would go to the bookstore and he didn't care how many books I wanted. It was never an issue. He would always buy me as many books as I wanted. And I just love flipping through books. Oh gosh, that's this part. This podcast goes back to old fashioned people who had taken board exams with pen and paper. Also, you know, the only thing available was a library. There wasn't the internet. So the old fashioned books kind of fits with going back in time and holding paper. There's nothing like that. You can't do that. You can't replace that electronically. Right. I do have a Oh, and I use that whenever I'm out of my house, but in my house, I like my books. Awesome. Well, I'm going to take you back because like I mentioned, this is a podcast for all levels of professionals. They're medical therapy, nutrition, physical therapy, but people who are just studying 
an internships or getting ready to take a board exam. So I'm going to take you back to a board exam that you might have taken. I don't know, you choose one, but is there a story or an anxiety level or something funny that you can remember from going back to that time? I remember taking my internal medicine board exam and it was actually, it was in this in San Francisco, which is where I did my residency. And I had to drive to get there. I was so stressed out that, you know, I wouldn't make it on time. They're very strict with times. You have to like come in at a specific time. You have to put all your stuff away. And I kept waking up like every hour, the whole night, every hour. And my husband's like, this isn't your first exam. Why are you like, this isn't my first exam, but this is the exam. What are you talking about? I'm like, of course I'm like weirded out. I left the house at four 30 in the morning. I got to the parking lot and just sat there all by myself for three hours. And I was just like, I don't care. I I'm here on time. That's all that matters. Oh my gosh. So three hours. Did you, you sat by yourself it's and how long, how long was the exam? Oh, it's a full day exam. It's, it's two blocks of like four or five hours. I don't remember, but it was like, yeah, it's a full oh, day. Yeah. That, that is so much wiser than my recent board exam where I missed a turn off the highway and it's in the middle of Kansas. So it was 30 minutes before I got to turn back around and I was over an li- hour late to my exam. Oh, oh. So oh, I praise Voss. you for what you did. That was a oh smart move. <laughs> All right. Well, I want, we are, we're just so glad to have you here. And the medical series was incredibly popular last year. So we would just like to hear how you got into the field of medicine and then, then into the field of eating disorders and, and, and how you learned what you learned. I'm also curious how you got into adolescent medicine too, because I see a lot from pediatrics and from family medicine, but not so much from internal med. So that would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So med medicine, I got into actually because of high school, there was a program through high school called hospital opportunity program for students. And that was in so Montreal is a little bit different. We go 10th and 11th grade. We don't have 12th, but I, I got accepted to the program. And basically you go and rotate through different hospital units once a week for five, six hours at a time. And that was my first real exposure into the medical field and really just started opening my mind to it. Before then, I always thought I was going to be a teacher or a lawyer And then, you know, just the science background and really enjoyed biology and chemistry and organic chemistry and all of that. So that sort of pushed me towards the medical science field. How I got into adolescent medicine. So I actually did a family medicine. I lived in Israel for 10 years. I did a family medicine residency there. So was exposed to pediatrics and a lot of ob through that residency. Met my husband, moved to San Francisco, did an internal medicine residency and was really lucky to have an amazing program director who saw my love for young adults and teens and was also lucky to have Dr. Wibblesman, Charles Wibblesman, who was then the director of the Adolescent Medicine Clinic at Kaiser in San Francisco. So I got to do all my electives with him and rotations um, and just fell in love with it and, and then was lucky to get into Stanford Fellowship. So Charles Wibblesman and Kaiser, so in the Midwest where I practice, that's not as popular, but a lot of people that I have sat next to at international conferences for eating disorders talk very highly about Kaiser. Yeah, it's definitely more of a West Coast. I, I didn't really know it before I moved to California myself, but it is really popular and very evidence-based driven in, in the West Coast. Yeah. I think Washington. What was the name of the doctor again, Charles? Um, and that, that is an adolescent med also or a f- internal medicine? No, he's adolescent med pediatrics, um, but, you know, written books. He's very well known in the field. 
Yes, I will second that. <laughs> okay, see? <laughs> like, Thank so, you. Uh, so what, what got you moving down the path of eating disorders and disordered eating, et cetera? Yeah, everything in between, right? So Stanford has a very, very large eating disorder program, as well as an inpatient medical unit, which I was lucky to be part of for many years and then work as an attending. But so that's sort of what started it for me. I mean, in the back of my mind, doing adolescent medicine always encompassed it all. But once I started working at Stanford, it was a very big focus because of their inpatient unit. I got to see all degrees of acuity, right? Like the really, 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 really long standing eating disorder patients that had tons of medical com- complications to the, you know, this has been like two months of restricting and uh, parents super high alert, bringing them in. So it was really just amazing learning experience to have both the inpatient side and the outpatient side at one facility, because often the eating disorder programs that I had seen didn't have a, a strong inpatient unit that was medical, not psych focused. I mean, of course, the inpatient unit had a lot of support from psychiatry and, and, and nutrition, but it was medically run. Awesome. So Tell us a little bit about your practice. And then we were talking before we hit record here that some of your practice, a good portion of that is virtual. Right. So currently I have a private practice in the eating disorder, disordered eating medical complications of, and that includes anything from uh, low heart rates, low blood pressure, missing periods, uh, right? Those are all medical complications, low bone density, things that are really, really important to, to know about and to educate our patients about because often they don't realize the medical complications associated with an eating disorder, right? And that's where the danger occurs from, from a medical standpoint. A lot of my practice is in person, but a lot of it is also virtual. Using a clear step scale, I can get their numbers transmitted to me. I do it all live, meaning I watch them get on the scale. And I think that's a really important component when you're doing this, because I have had clients who will truthfully say, I try to manipulate things by getting on the scale with my cat, with getting on the scale with some weights. And of course, you know, when you look at the platform of the scale, uh, clear step, you can see when there's been a really large jump, you see the percent change and you can recognize that there's a problem. But, you know, a lot of our clients have been dealing with this for many, many years and sort of know the system. So I, I feel more comfortable when I see them doing it with me live. And then I have them do vitals with me. So I have them lie down for five minutes and then get a blood pressure and a heart rate and then stand up for two minutes and get a blood pressure and a heart rate. And that's called orthostasis. So when someone goes from the lying to the standing position, we all have a jump in our heart rate, but we don't want that jump in our heart rate to be too high or that signifies that there's malnutrition. How do you Um, get those measurements? So uh, they can either get a blood pressure cuff from any, you know, CVS, Walgreens, any of those called, you know, an Omron or or any typical blood pressure cuff. ClearStep also has a blood pressure cuff that they can purchase with the scale. And so those numbers are also electronically sent over. And are they, I'm assuming, automatic blood pressure cuffs? They're not manually taken? Correct. And do you find those to be accurate enough, especially for some of our patients that are sicker and have lower blood pressures? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've had it record, you know, 79 over 40s. I really, it's actually pretty great with heart rates, sometimes better than medical assistance that I've had count. (laughs) So, you know, it, it, I I think it's pretty effective when numbers are off, they're off. And I think that that is definitely picked up. Right. Yeah. That just helps your management to know, are they sick or not? Oh, absolutely. The base of my management, right? Exactly. 
Uh, I, you know, I had a client a few weeks ago that was referred for IOP for an intensive outpatient program. And I was doing the clearance and it was by Zoom. And I could see right away, just speaking to him that he was foggy. He just had brain fog from the degree of malnutrition. Everything he was saying was slow. And uh, uh, questions I was asking him, you could see in his eyes that the processing was just slower. He was very, you know, had a blank face, wasn't really talking except for just answering yes or no questions. And then I had him lie down and do the vitals and his heart rate was 41. Ooh, and- not good. Oh. Not good. And it just went along with the way he, right, with the way he was speaking, with the slowness of everything. I was like, oh, yeah, this is pretty bad. So I did send him to be admitted. I and that, an admission. So, yeah. And that brings up another question I had um, that when you're doing these telehealth visits, I imagine a lot of physicians are like, how do you get a good enough exam? So, what is it that you're specifically looking at? Can you give us any tips? Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I I don't get a good heart exam, that is for sure. But again, I can see color. I can see, um, I often have them lift their shirts up. So I can see intercostal muscles, I can see back muscles, I'll have them when they stand up, I can see gluteal muscles. So butt muscles, their face, right? A lot of our, our clients will lose their temporal muscle that is very clearly seen through video and then skin again skin dryness skin color skin texture all that can be seen depending on the client sometimes i'll have them palpate their their neck and their supraclavicular area to look for any lymph nodes you can see hair right so the lanugo the the hair that grows with severe malnutrition you can see that on the arms you can see that on the face so little things that you pick up are do- from doing this for so many years. And just their mental status too, like you were saying, is they're just not responding as quick as you would expect. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you were mentioning that your, your client or your patient was surprised that you could tell so much. Yeah. My client with the dry skin, he was just like, what? How did you <laughs> And I was like, well, your, your knuckles are all red and peeling and chapped. I mean, you know, they think that I'm just looking at them speaking and that I'm not looking at the whole, you know, some of this is also really, really cool on my end because I've never been in these at their homes, right? I mean, when they come to my office, it's in my office. I haven't seen how they live, where they live. And that tells so much about them as well, right? About, you know, how their room looks or their kitchen or wherever they're, you know, they're zooming from it. That too gives a lot of information, which I think is just another perspective that as clinicians, we don't often get. Mm -hmm. And if they're lying on their bed, still curled up in the blanket or, or if they're dressed in, you know, appropriate. One thing I do hear that's pretty consistent. It sounds like you require your patients to be at home or at least in a building, not driving in a car and, and not multitasking. I think that's really important. They need to be in a place that is secure, meaning that they feel comfortable in, but also where there's privacy and they need to be able to lie down. You know, I have college students that I zoom with and they, you know, I always make them, them kick out their roommates. I, you know, have to make sure that, you know, privacy, but also that they're at a place where they can feel comfortable opening up because so much of this, right, definitely there's the medical side, but there is the side that's where this is coming from and what, what is happening in their lives, whether it's past trauma they have to talk about or family situations or interfamily systems or whatever is going on, stress at school, and I need them to be able to be open and forthcoming. I love that because our clinic has struggled with those things. Even the parents, you know, they're like, oh, I'm at the grocery store. And you're thinking, oh, how can you get a really good visit when you're picking out avocados? Yeah, you can't. <laughs> Unless you're a nutritionist shopping with them, maybe right. <laughs> get some, but... I can get some information about <laughs> yeah. what they're picking out. Same on my end too, right? Like I am in a place where I can give them my full attention and, and make sure point. 
is is provided, right? I'm not out shopping or in the car doing anything like that. Mm-hmm. All right, let's take a quick break to recognize our sponsor, My Clear Step. If you haven't heard of them, they have numberless scales and are the first HIPAA compliant solution to a blind weigh in for clients working to recover from their eating disorders. And although I had heard of this, Several years ago, these scales became a game changer during the pandemic for so many of us, myself included. Seamless access to data for clinicians and a simple anxiety-free virtual experience for clients and families. They are offering a discount to listeners of this podcast with the code Beth Harrell at myclearstep.com. Information in the show notes. So you had mentioned, because we will we have an episode with uh, Jessica Lauren Newby. I've, an amazing dietitian, and she's talking about best practices for telehealth and, and the scale. We didn't talk a lot about the blood pressure cuff, but you mentioned like holding your cat. So when I've used the scale, I ask my clients and I call them clients and they can be clients, patients, whatever to, I don't do it live, but that's not a bad idea because it's super easy. They just stand on it and they pull up their app and then it comes right to me. Yeah. But I asked them to get on at the same time, right? Be the day of our appointment, no socks or shoes on so that I don't put a lot into the bioimpedance portion, but it may, if somebody's water loading or fluid loading show a difference. What do you mean by bioimpedance? So when you go to the clear step portal, Mm-hmm. When the weight comes in, there is a percent fat, percent muscle mass, percent visceral fat level and BMI okay. that are part of the portal. So you see all of that when you log on. And uh, I agree with you, Beth. I mean, I don't think it's super accurate unless, right, because they have to be completely naked without any even like cream or anything like that for any of those to be super specific. But if I see large fluctuations in them, then it, you know, raises a question mark in my head and I ask more questions depending on what I'm seeing. So it more as like a red flag. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's those large changes. So I had a patient who it was like a six pound change from one week to the next. And there was not a change. He was not I endorsing any change in his activity level, his intake. I, I called and talked with his mom. This was a teenager. So I said, I think he needs to go see his regular doctor in person because I'm really concerned. Well, what we found out is that they, the mom had moved it from a tile floor to a carpeted floor. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to, you, you do have to make sure that the scale is on a floor tile. You know, I I even have a a Stanford student who I see, she's so sweet and she bought a tile because she's in a dorm and they only have carpets. So she actually bought one tile and puts the scale on the tile, but you also can't have socks and obviously no shoes, but that's a good thing because we never want them to be with shoes, but they also have to take off their socks. Do you guys make them use the restroom beforehand? I do. Sometimes that is trickier because they don't always have that right away available to them, depending like, you know, where they are and who, who's the client. But I try to make sure that they do that. Also, I would say that most clients I see on on a regular basis at a regular time right? I don't see them like once in the morning, then like a week later in the afternoon, I, they mostly have a regular time schedule. So they're getting on the scale at about the same time every week or every other week or whatever it is. Yeah, all good points. It, I, it is. And so Dr. Voss, it's one of those things that whether a clinician agrees that the weights need to be blind or open, for these clients, it just lets them know somebody's able to see that and they don't have to focus on the number because those numbers can just turn into a rabbit hole very quickly. Also, those numbers fluctuate, right? I mean, if it's a teen who's at the prime of their growth chart and every three months that weight is changing, I mean, right, even if they don't have any eating disorder, if they're just 
14 years old and they're coming in for a visit, if we would take them 14 and three months, 14 and six months, 14, you know, that weight is constantly moving. So to have them focus on a number that is continuously changing, just, you know, defe- defeats the purpose and feeds the eating disorder. So you brought up one of my favorite topics, and that is determining appropriate weight ranges in those growing adolescents and young adults. So any advice or tips on how you go about determining where their weight goal should be? Yeah. So first and foremost, growth charts. I think those are super important. So I try to always get those from the pediatricians because if we have a kid that's always been on the 25th percentile, I am not going to get them to the 50th percentile. It's just, it's not fair to the family. It's not fair to the kid. It's a lot of pressure. I will get them back to their 25th percentile curve, right? I will push for that, but I won't push to get them to a higher curve. If they've always been a 50th percentile kid, or if they've always been a 75th percentile kid, right? If we're looking at anyone who's in a larger body, right? I And they've dropped curves. I want to get them back to their curve because that is where they are going to potentiate their growth. And right now we need to potentiate their growth. That's how I look at it. So To go back to your question, growth growth charts first. And once I establish that, then I find a median body weight number. So that that number that'll get them to the 50th percentile of their BMI chart based on what curve they're at, right? So if it's 50th percentile, because that's pretty easy, then I'll go to their age, their height, and and I'll find that number that gets them to the 50th percentile. So I should ask with the, do you, are you a believer in open weights, blind weights, or a little bit of both depending on the client patient? I mean, I think it really depends on the client, but overall I've never seen, do you mean, should they know their goal weight? Um, Should they know their weight each time? Yeah. Do you share weights at every visit or do you? those back? I, 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 what I share is whether there's progress or no progress, whether we have to change anything in the nutrition component or the exercise component. You know, to me, a healthy weight is one where, you know, if it's a female, there's regular periods, regular menstruation, right? Because we want bone, bone growth. So that is what's key at this age. So if, I have a female client who is getting regular periods, who is doing the sport she wants to be doing and weight is in a well-maintained place, then that's a good weight, right? If we don't have periods, but she's made the, the weight that we expect, then we have to push, right? I mean, everybody's a little bit different. And although we would love for everyone to have read the books, that's not how it always works. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> Too bad, right? I love what you said, because I always struggle sometimes when I want to give feedback, but I don't want to use numbers. And so I'm like, well, it's up, it's down, but you use the word progress. And I really like that because it's more inclusive to not just wait, but we're working towards a goal and you are making progress to that goal. So thanks for that terminology. I'm going to use that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I think the focus should be away from just one specific number because that number fluctuates also whether they've had a bowel movement, whether, you know, they're getting, you know, they had more water running. I mean, that number is so volatile, changes so often that I I would not want them to base how well they're doing or how, how hard they're trying because of one, one, one number. And that really can go off, off kilter pretty quickly if they're looking too closely. It's kind of like food labels. I mean, if we're looking at a black and white food label and it says I, you're supposed to have a half a cup, people think that they're supposed to have a half a cup. Well, that, that may not be right for them. And progress would be not looking at the label, but also being able to eat until they're satisfied and And like you said, when weight is stable, are there other medical things that you look at besides the period and the weight? Heart rates are a big thing. So, you know, you definitely want to have a heart rate that's above 50 uh, during the day. 
and orthostatic tachycardia or hypotension. So a, a jump in your heart rate when you're standing up or a drop in your blood pressure when you're standing up, those are all signs of malnutrition. The other thing I think is also important to, to discuss is, is that we're talking about malnutrition, right? We're talking about degrees of malnutrition, whether the mild, moderate, or severe, and that's based on you know, where the client has been and how much weight they've dropped. And, and I think that allows us to include a much greater population. I think that's often how eating disorders are missed in clients in larger bodies, because they're, they're looking at us again at that one specific number, instead of looking at the degree of change. Yeah. They can even be praised for that one specific number and not even paying attention to how they got to that number, which is so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it can be too with, so with the blind or open, if with the clear step scale too, and I'll just share uh, that this was a different male teen that I was working with. He was in college, so freshman, but we really, I just shared the information with the medical doctor and tried to get him to not pay attention to the minutia of the weight number. And then when he got to a place where he was stable for about eight to 12 weeks, it was in that range. And that's where the doctor felt like he had done okay. Then we started talking numbers and that's okay too, but it depends on the client, depends on the patient. Yeah. The other thing I think is helpful with a clear step scale is that, you know, we always tell our clients to move away or we try to have them move away from daily weighing, right? A lot of our clients get on that scale multiple times a day or once a day at minimum, which becomes very obsessive and compulsive. And we want to move away from that. I think having a scale where you don't see a number and it it takes away from that, I also often tell families, you know, I don't want them weighing more than once a week. It reminds me of a client I had who was removed, who, who got discharged from residential. And one of the things she told me was, you know, I never cared about my weight until I got to residential. And I said, oh, what do you mean? And she was like, well, I never weighed myself. That wasn't part of my eating disorder. But when I got to residential and they were constantly weighing me every day, I was getting on that scale. It became an obsession. Wow. Um, even if I couldn't see the number, but I was getting onto something. So I think that's an important aspect of this as well. I agree. Definitely. And like you said, in those people in larger bodies that maybe are malnourished, but don't have weight to restore necessarily. So you, you, you know, sometimes I don't even weigh my patients. I just go strictly off of my vital sign, other vital signs and my physical exam and how they're doing psychologically and we leave it at that. show, Yeah. That that number isn't everything. Okay. I was hoping to touch base on one thing. Beth has mentioned a lot about her male clients and we've, we've touched base on periods and estrogen and bone growth. I'm curious, Dr. Barr, if you have any guidelines or advice on bone development or hormone puberty development in males. So when do you get that DEXA scan in a male or when do you become concerned that their bones are weak or they're not growing appropriately? Yeah. So I have to say, I'm always concerned. (laughs) (laughs) Good. I'm always concerned. You know, I do think it's a lot less talked about COVID, I think really let, you know, and there were all these New York Times articles about it and and males and eating disorders. I definitely see it in my practice. There's been a large increase in male eating disorder clients. I first start as always with history. So I ask the hard questions. Are you waking up with morning erections? Are you able to feel, how is your libido? You know, those are our big concerns in males that they'll, they often won't talk about the weakness in their, in their activity, in their exercise, or they're, you know, unable to lift, you know, I used to be able to lift X pounds and now I can't, that's less talked about. But if you start talking to them about what's going on with them sexually, that provides a lot of information. I get a testosterone level, just like I would get an estradiol level in a female, I get a testosterone level in a male, and they are often really low. 
And that tells me too, that there is a reproductive problem and that the, and you know, I, I, if this is a pre-pubertal male, then that will affect puberty and that might affect their height growth. And it might affect how quickly they, they get into post-puberty time. So this is kind of a dietitian question that, that both of you medical doctors are going to say, Beth, you've been doing this for 30 years and you have this question. So for females, there's a, is it um, follicle stimulating or is it the estradiol that depends on the month, the time of month? So they all three, LH, FSH, and estradiol all depend okay. on, but when you are looking at those numbers based on malnutrition, the whole axis will be low. So okay. when it's period related, the numbers fluctuate differently. When it's PCOS, your estradiol could be normal and your FSH and LH can be different. But when you're talking about malnutrition, your whole axis is low. So your okay. FSH and estradiol are all low because the body is trying to defend itself, right? It's saying, I'm not going to have a reproductive self when I can provide myself with enough energy. So I'm just going to depress the whole axis from the brain down to the ovaries and not have any hormones. Okay. So is there something similar in males or is it just testosterone? Are there cycles? You, or- you can H and then FSH, but I would, I feel the most accurate is this testosterone, a really low testosterone. Yeah. And that's consistent with what I do too. And females, I usually will get the FSH and estradiol together because I'm often dealing with different stages of puberty and it just really helps solidify that picture for me. And I do staging of where they, their sexual maturity rating or Tanner staging to help with that as well. Thank you so much. Okay. So this time went really fast. I have a wrap up question. Dr. Voss, did you have anything else that you want to make sure to cover? Okay. So Dr. Barr, going back to when you first entered medical school or the field of eating disorders, what do you wish you would have known then that you know now? And take your time with that question if you need to, because it's a big, you've given us a lot of information of things that you've learned over the years. For those who are just starting out, let's spare them. (laughs) Oh, I don't know if I would them because I think that every, you know, every experience that I had as someone who did two residencies and a fellowship, I can say I didn't, you know, love doing that at that moment in my life, especially having two kids through my, through internal medicine residency. But, you know, I think every part of it taught me something. And I think what I would look at my younger self and say is, try to breathe through it and see what it's trying to teach you, what, it, what path it's trying to take you on, because the path is constantly changing. You know, if someone would have said to me, you know, a year ago, you would be living in LA doing a private practice, I would say, what? I'm never leaving Stanford, you know? And I, I think every, every door you open and every path you take leads you to another door and another path and trying to breathe through it and and trying to look through and see what you can learn from that is is key to moving forward. I love that. Breathe I through do it. Too. Breathe through it. And so this is what I love about doctors who decide to practice in eating disorders is that there can be the whole analytical piece of doctors who are doing a lot of the research, but also kind of the narrative, like you talked about, Dr. Barr, is just breathing through it. Like, don't be afraid of the things that that you're going to mess up on, because it's all a learning experience. And you will mess up. <laughs> and you will mess up. <laughs> right. well, you will hear no. You know, I think the first time you hear that no, you're like, you cringe, right? You're like, what do I do now? Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. If you've made it this far, I want to thank you. And we ask that you please review, follow, and share this podcast with others so that it can get out. And stay tuned for a little more from our Clear Step sponsors, including an in-depth discussion about best practices using numberless scales. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. 
If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethherrell.com slash professionals.